did anybody uh, this weekend by chance happen to drive by or go to one of the local movie theaters at all? Did you notice? They're packed, right? The, the parking lots are full. My daughter um, went to see, as, as so many have, the last part of the Marvel Avengers series. Um, the movie entitled Endgame. My wife said as she was dropping her off at the movie theater, you could hardly get in and out of there. Um, when the tickets went up for sale for this movie, websites and apps on people's phones were crashing because the demand was so high. And I'm not a, a, a um, huge aficionado of these superhero movies. I do enjoy them. My kids have kind of gotten into them, so... I'm learning through them. Um, Pastor Andrew, he, he knows what he's talking about, right? Like he, he loves these sorts of things. In fact, I think just in the last few days, he's gone to see um, this movie, which is over three hours more than once. But the fans, the fans of these movies were so motivated because the movie, the last movie, the previous movie ended, it concluded in the place of defeat. It concluded in tragedy. The, the bad guy, uh, if you haven't seen the movie now, by, that's on you. I'm not giving anything away, okay? <laughs> the bad guy at the end of the previous movie won. And so this movie is, is opening up at the place of tragedy. Where the questions that everyone is asking is where will hope come from? Who, who, who is going to redeem the situation? Where is there any, any hope for salvation? Today we are beginning a new series. It's a series that is focused on an ancient story found in the Old Testament. About a woman named Ruth. Her mother-in-law, Naomi. And, and a family member, a distant family member named Boaz. And it's a story that begins in tragedy. It, it leaves us asking these same questions. Where will hope come from? Where is there redemption? Who is going to intercede in order to bring salvation out of despair? Now, the book of Ruth is an interesting book. It's a short book. It's, in fact, it's one of the shortest books in the Old Testament. About four chapters long, maybe 15 minutes to read it, um, the whole thing from beginning to end. And its, its position in the Old Testament is interesting because as you watch and you read through the Old Testament, you're reading through the book of Judges, you're reading the history of Israel, and that's what precedes the book of Ruth. And then immediately following that is 1 Samuel, and so you have sort of the experience of the people of Israel, the story of God as, as they're wanting and desiring and, and figuring out who's going to lead them. And so there's this season of judges and then 1 Samuel brings in the people who are asking for a king and ultimate God's provision or allowance of that. And Ruth stands as kind of almost this um, side story. Or the way I like to say it, a, a story within the story. You know what I mean, right? It, it's like when somebody asks you, well, how was your vacation? And you're telling them about your vacation, but then you have to tell them about how you ran into your neighbor, you know, 800 miles away in some small story. It's, it's that little story within the big narrative that you're telling. And, and Ruth is kind of reads like that. When you pick it up, we're reading this, this big God story, how he's working to redeem his people. And it's as almost as if the, the, that God and the, the writers of the Old Testament, they just, we want to tell you something really amazing that God did. We, we, we want to see, show you firsthand his, his specific care and love. It's the amazing story of, of a widow and how God, in these very personal and relational ways, will use her and work through her in order to, to continue the story of his redemption of his people. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, let's turn to the book of Ruth. As I said, it's just after 
Judges and just before 1 Samuel. We're going to start, we're going to focus on chapter 1 today. So I'm going to begin in verse 1 and read verse 1 and 2 to start us off. In the days when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land. And so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of their sons were Malon and Kilion. And they were Amaphorites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now this story, the story of Ruth, begins in the place of a desperate move. It begins with a desperate move. As we're introduced here, we're introduced to a man named Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, who decide to take their two sons and to uproot them and go to live in the land of Moab, which was no small decision. This is not a a, a next-door neighbor, but a distant journey. And it says in the text that they do so because there was famine in the land of Judah. So I, I want to take a moment just to consider the context, to, to, the context to, to consider what's going on here. Like, have you ever had one of those moments in life when you've doubled down on a bad decision, right? When, when you've made a bad decision and you sort of find yourself in that place and you say, you know what, I'm going to give this one more try. This is, this is kind of like what we've got going on in the text. Several years ago, I decided that it was time to take better care of myself, to get a little healthier, and, and I was trying to be inspired, and I started to work out. And I have a tendency, when I do things like this, to, to go overboard. And so I got this whole workout program, and I, I wanted to get healthy, and I started the first day, and I did the program, and I could feel that evening, I could feel just the soreness in my muscles. But I started to give myself a little inspirational speech and I said you know what I got to stick with the program I got to get up tomorrow and I got to do it again and so I did and I I got up tomorrow and I did it again and matter of fact I pushed a little bit harder no pain no gain I told myself right day three comes along I could not walk (laughs) literally I, I had to go up and down stairs like this because my muscles would not allow me to walk straight up and downstairs because I I doubled down on a bad decision. I knew after day one, this was too much and I need to ease into this. But I said, let's give this another shot. See, Elimelech here, he's doubling down on a bad decision. We find a lot out here in this very introduction to the book of Ruth about the spiritual condition of the people of God. At the outset, it tells us in the days that the judges ruled, In fact, if you flip over just one page to the book of Judges, the very last verse in the very last chapter of the book of Judges says this. It says, in those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. In some other translations it said, each man did what was right in his own eyes. See, before... God had had established the people of Israel in the promised land. He he made a covenant with them. And he said, as a part of this covenant, I'm going to take you into a place. I'm going to provide you with this promised land. And he's describing this to the people of Israel. He says this land is going to be a place flowing with milk and honey. A land of abundance and provision. If you remember... Joshua Joshua and Caleb, when they're sent by Moses into the land and to to spy it out, to check out this promised land that God is taking them to, and they come back and they say, it's all true. There's this abundance there. There's provision. In fact, it says that they brought back samples of the fruit so that they could show the people and say, everything that God has told us about this land is true. It's all real. You can read it in the the book of Numbers. But now as we open up the book of Ruth, it opens up, the scene opens up on famine. It opens up in in a lack of of food. In fact, the, the name Bethlehem, where they're from, literally translates to house of bread. 
So when the book of Ruth opens up, it opens up on the house of bread with no bread. God has made a covenant with his people, and this is a turning point. Very early in this story, the people are failing to follow God. It says in Judges that they're operating as if what it means to do right and wrong is based on their own opinion and how they see things. Everyone is doing right according to their own eyes. If you read in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 28, when God is making a covenant with the people of Israel, he sets up very clearly and he says, this will be your experience. If you live in obedience to the covenant, if you follow what I've given you, your experience in the promised land is going to be one of provision and abundance. But on the flip side of that, he says to the people of Israel in that time, but if you, if you walk away from that, if you break these covenant terms that we have established together, he says no very clearly at the outset that there's going to be consequences of that. One of which, he says, very specifically will be famine in the land, that the land itself will suffer as a result of their own disobedience. And so now as we open up the book of Ruth, coming out of Judges, we discover that they're experiencing that. They're, they're living that. They're in the midst of this famine. It says it was in the days when the judges ruled and there was famine in the land. And so now we get some insight into where Elimelech and his family are living. And in this moment, Elimelech doubles down on a bad decision. Instead of, leaving, or instead of leading his family and, and the people around him into a place of repentance, instead of returning to obedience to God, Elimelech says, well, the only practical thing to do is, is to pack up and move to Moab, this far-off foreign land outside of God's provision and protection. So essentially, Elimelech's idea is, I, I, we want to experience the provision of God. We want to experience the blessing of God, but without the repentance that, that takes us there. So he packs up his family and he moves them to a foreign land. As Sinclair Ferguson puts it in, in his commentary on the book of Ruth, he says, instead of turning back to God, they turn their backs on God. Now, it, it can be easy to look at Elimelech's decision and, and be almost somewhat judgmental of it. But as I was thinking about this and processing it this week, I recognized that Elimelech's decision here is, is not so foreign to my own heart, to my own walk with Jesus. When, when following Jesus becomes difficult, when it requires something of me that, that I'm not sure that I want to give, when it asks something of me that I'm not sure I want to do. It can look very, very appealing to, to look over there and to say to ourselves, well, it just seems so much easier over here. It, it, this would just be so much simpler if, if we just compromise a little bit and, and, and we'll go live over here. We, we experience this desire for Moab in our own hearts and lives, in our own efforts to walk with Jesus. But the problem is, is oftentimes we desire to experience the blessings of God outside of, of relationship with God. And this is the decision that Elimelech makes. Oftentimes when we make that decision, you, you get the sense in the text that in Elimelech and Naomi's mind, this is a temporary decision. We, we will just go for a little while. But so often for us, as it was for them, we end up staying in Moab far longer than we intended. For Elimelech and his family, things go from bad to worse. If you turn back to Ruth chapter 1, picking it up now in verse 3, it says, Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons, and they married Moabite women one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they lived there about 10 years, both Malion and Kilion also died. 
Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Now Naomi finds herself in a very, very desperate situation. The the fact that she is living in a foreign land as a widow and now as uh, without her two sons means that her entire capacity to even survive is compromised. The, The means that she had to provide for herself, let alone for her daughters in laws is is scant at best. And so now in the story it moves from a desperate move to a place of despair, but it is also despair and hope. It is despair and hope. Naomi now finds herself in Moab. She finds herself in a place very far from the promise that God had pretended or uh, provided for his people. Naomi finds herself in the place where she has lost everything. A place of despair, even hopelessness. But in the midst of the despair, we will discover that hope breaks in. Hope breaks in. Now back in verse 6. It says, When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Did you catch that? Did you catch in the midst of the despair and the hopelessness, hope breaking in? See, light, light is most observable it's most noticeable to us in the midst of deepest darkness we're we're most cognizant of even the smallest bit of light when things are the darkest i uh, several years ago i had the opportunity to take some of our students on a mission trip to puerto rico and the host that was um, that we were partnering with there was a local church there and we were serving in the community and doing some VBS and evangelism and, and working with um, um, some different ministries that, that partnered there. And at the end of the trip, he wanted to do something to sort of surprise the students and, and bless them. And I don't know if you've ever been to Puerto Rico. It's a beautiful island with beautiful people. And they have one of the phenomenon of our world. It's called the Bioluminescent Bay. Has anybody ever been to a Bioluminescent Bay? Well, you got to go. Um, it, it is amazing. Because I think there's maybe five of these in the entire world, and two or three of them are in Puerto Rico. And there is these tiny microorganisms that live in in the water. And so when the sun goes down and, and things are dark, you can look in the water, and if you stir it, it just glows. Like, all these little microorganisms just start to glow. And so we took the students out and in a boat and they are actually able to like jump out in the ocean in the water and they're swimming around and you could hold up your hands and you'd see the water flowing off and it was just like glowing streams of water i've never seen anything like it or done anything like it so the first year we went i was just amazed at the whole thing but the second year we went we were going back to take the students to do the same thing i was looking forward to it Um, but this time it was a new moon meaning that there was there was no moon out it was pitch black out there you jumped in that water and it was as if somebody flipped a switch you could see in the wake of the boat just light gleaming because the the intensity of these tiny little microorganisms was so bright in the absence of any other light see naomi here in this situation she finds herself in a place of utter despair of hopelessness and then in verse 6 Living in Moab, she gets word there's food back in Israel. That that God's covenant promise has come back after 10 years. And we're not told the backstory here. We don't know what what led the people to repentance. We don't know what unfolded. All we know is that Naomi gets word that back in her home, back in Bethlehem, the house of bread, there's once again food to eat. And so as we're reading this story, Naomi sets out and she determines that she is going to to return to her home, to go back there even in the midst of her grief and her emptiness. 
it says that when she left for, for Moab, she left full. And now as she returns back to Bethlehem, she's coming back empty. In fact, I'm going to jump a little bit to the end of the chapter. Just I want us to see kind of the condition that Naomi's returning with. This is verse 20 and 21. Naomi has now arrived back in Bethlehem, and she says, Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. In fact, just previous to these verses, when Naomi is arriving in Bethlehem, the the people see her. And they even ask themselves the question, can this be Naomi? Naomi left here with Elimelech. She left with her two sons. And now as she returns, she comes back without them. She left full, but now returns empty. And to them, she's barely recognizable. But Naomi does not, in fact, return alone. In the midst of this story of the despair and the hope breaking, and there's this incredible expression of compassion and faith that takes place here. Naomi is, in in verse 7 now, with her two widowed daughter-in-laws. She is determined, in verse 6, to return to the land of Bethlehem to go back to her people, and they set out to make that trip. And partly along the way, she decides in this act of compassion to her daughter-in-laws to release them from the sense of obligation culturally that they had to her, the connection that they had to her. And so she says to them, despite really being her only lifeline at this point, she says to them, it would be better for you if you returned to your home. This would give you a better chance of starting over, picking it up now in verse 8. Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye and they wept out loud. And she said to her, we will go back, uh, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. You can can almost hear the grief in Naomi's words. She's even in the midst of that expressing her hope of blessing for her daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Naomi, while at the same time lamenting the sense that she has that God has, has forgotten her. That, that he has abandoned her. Orpah here, the one daughter-in-law, really does the sensible thing. She at first refuses Naomi's offer, but then after Naomi persists, she reconsiders and she returns home. She, she, she goes back to what she knows. She goes back reasonably now to to the best possible outcome for her to to the best possible future in her mind given her circumstances but ruth does something extraordinary in verse 16 these these are ruth's words she says to naomi now don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God, and where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. 
And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. See, in the midst of, of all of this darkness, light has now broken in. Naomi has word that God's blessing has returned to Bethlehem. And, and Ruth makes this incredible statement of faith. You, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. See, there's, there is a lot for us that goes unspoken here. For, from a purely practical point of view, Orpah's decision is the right decision, and Ruth is taking a huge risk. But again, Sinclair Ferguson, in his book, Faithful God, he, he describes the contrast of these two decisions this way. In Ruth's mind, he says, Jehovah plus nothing in Bethlehem, or everything minus Jehovah and Moab. Let me say that again. Jehovah plus nothing in Bethlehem, or everything minus Jehovah and Moab. And Ruth, Ruth acts in faith. Faith in what she cannot see. Faith in what she does not yet know. When God called Abraham to leave his home, he called him out to what he did not know. In fact, what, the only thing he did know was that God would go with him. When Jesus came to his disciples and he said, drop everything and follow me, there was no assurance of, of safety or security. Other than the fact that wherever they would go, Jesus would go with them. You see, Ruth's response here in, in chapter 1 is the very essence of faith. It is confidence of what we hope for and insurance of what we do not see, as it says in Hebrews chapter 11. See, Naomi wasn't the only one who lost everything in Moab. But Ruth, in the midst of, of her own desperation, of her own despair, her despair, of her own fear, fear with this very covenant language that says, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. And what results from this, this statement of faith, this act of faith, is a new beginning. A new beginning. Verse 22 now. The last verse in this chapter. Naomi and Ruth have returned to Bethlehem. So it says, Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Now, I don't know, it, it may be for some of you this is your story, but, but I love the story of new beginnings. I have a good friend of mine who, um, I've talked about him before, but when we were at Moody together, he came there as, later in life, as a few years older than me, his mid-20s, and he came out of a drug rehab facility. Um, as a high school student, he had gotten very involved with the wrong crowd, began a drug habit that led to addiction that, as it so often does, leads to decisions and actions and ultimately found him in jail and facing charges. And as he was in front of a judge, the judge said to him, look, I'm going to give you an option. One, here's your jail time. You can go and serve that. Or two, I, I will allow you in exchange of that to go into this teen challenge program, a drug rehabilitation center that, that, um, that you can do in exchange of that. Um, and it happened to be a, a Christian drug rehabilitation center. And so in this sort of desperate move to avoid going to jail for an extended amount of time, he chose the, re, uh, the rehab center despite all sorts of fear about what he might be walking into. In fact, he told me, because he knew it was this religious Christian rehab center, that he left a secret note in a book on his parents' 
bookshelf so that he would have a way to communicate to them that these people are crazy and they're trying to brainwash me uh, if they needed to come get out of there. Mike would talk about that day as the darkest day of his life. But he said it was the best day of my life. Because that set me on the path in my worst moment to where I would meet Jesus where he would enter that rehab facility, where he would hear the gospel for himself in a way that he had never understood or know before and initiate something that changed his life forever, changed the course of his life forever. People sometimes used to ask him, how did you, how did you get into Moody when they knew his story? And he would just laugh and say, oh God, God did that. It was a new beginning. His worst moment of his life was the, the best moment of his life. You see, here in the very end of chapter 1, we get this very small hint that God is up to something. The chapter begins with this description of famine in the land. It's this awareness of the experience of, of uh, the consequence of unconfessed sin. But it concludes with harvest. It concludes with provision and blessing. It says they're arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest is beginning. This is more than merely a, a phrase to indicate what time of year it was. This is, this is pointing us forward to the work of God. Notice that the, uh, the flow of this chapter here. It starts in a place of desperation that's brought on by disobedience. It, it moves to from desperation to devastation and even hopelessness. But there in the midst of the hopelessness, there's, there's a return that happens, an act of repentance because they hear a word of hope. It's followed by this poetic and this powerful expression of faith by Ruth who comes to recognize that for her, no matter what the cost is, she wants to be where God is. And they arrive in that place. She enters into Bethlehem with this as her backstory in the moment when the barley harvest is just beginning. You see, God is doing something new. It's a new beginning. It's as if the author is saying to us, you, don't, you won't believe what happens next. You, you don't want to miss what God is going to do next. You see, Ruth chapter 1 is that story within the story, and it is the story within the larger story of the gospel. It, it describes a condition far from God, one of rebellion and brokenness. It describes the arrival of good news and the invitation to return, and it describes a faith that understands that true life is discovered in the place that God dwells in a relationship with him. And so as this chapter one of this incredible story is unfolding, it's unfolding at the very outset of a new beginning, that God is doing something new, as he so often does. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity just to begin to look at the story of Ruth. An ancient story and yet a story that is also so familiar. And Lord, we thank you that Ruth, in whatever way, ways that we don't fully understood, seemed to grasp the fact that you were drawing her home, drawing her to this place. And her confession of faith, that she would go where you are. Lord, may the same be true of us this morning, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.